And here we go. Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Tonya Pitts, and I am the sommelier and wine director at One Market Restaurant, as well as the founder of Tonya Pitts Consulting. And welcome to Rate Cellar. And we have Rebecca Weinberg with us today from Quintessa Wines. And I am so, so excited because we're going to taste through some wines um, this afternoon and talk about the long awaited um, 2018 vintages as well. So welcome everyone. I'm gonna give everyone a few moments to join us. Um, it's a few minutes after three o'clock, but I'll give everyone a moment to, to get here in front of us and enjoy some wine with us this afternoon and have a lively conversation with Rebecca. So we can talk about some of my favorite wines. I'm, <laughs> I'm super excited. And Rebecca, I'll tell you, I am uh, currently pouring 2017 Illumination by the glass, um, mm -hmm. which it's always in the house at the restaurant as well as Quintessa itself. But um, it was really, it's really nice to be able for me, for myself, for my palate, to be able to have the two kind of side by side in my mind. And um, earlier in the year, um, I was also able to taste from the library 2010 uh, Quintessa. So this is oh just, it's just, it's, it's amazing. And just everything that you all do, it's, it's really about sense of place and being stewards um, of the land as well. And just everything that, that you all do, um, the biodynamic farming, um, the vineyards never having been vineyards before and, and being able to plot everything out that you wanted to do. Um, Valeria, Cuneus and uh, Augustine Senior. And it's, I don't know if everyone realizes just how much love and care and dedication has gone into to farming and being the stewards um, of the vineyards and of the land there, so. Well, thank you. I mean, you're so right, because everything, everything starts with the land, it starts with the soil and with the terroir. and both Quintessa and Illumination are wines that are what I would call transparent to terroir, mm -hmm. that speak, are very distinctive and speak of, of a place and a intention um, and illumination. So I have the 2018 illumination in my glass. I've, I kind of have 2018 right now as actually my home by the glass pour, <laughs> if that's a thing. I'm drinking so much of it. Um, because this is a wine for me that is very flexible. Um, like I drink it as a glass of wine in place of a cocktail while I'm cooking dinner. And then I think it also is a really perfect match on the table for food. Um, Illumination, for those of you who are new to Illumination, Illumination is the white wine from Quintessa. It's our partner to Quintessa. It is a blend of Sauvignon Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc Musquet, and Semillon. And I'm working with different fermentation vessels. So it's all barrel fermented, but there's five different types of barrels, for lack of a better word, um, that add complexity and body and texture to this wine. So it's not a, just about acidity, citrus character. It is a wine that has minerality. It has a sense of roundness and a really compelling texture that comes from the use of the concrete eggs, a little bit of new French oak, acacia wood barrels, stainless steel barrels, neutral barrels, all of that together and working with the blend to make a wine that is just delicious and ageable. I mean, I know we're here and we're gonna be talking a lot about ageability for Quintessa and ageability about red wines, but you know, Sauvignon Blanc is also eminently ageable. Um, Tonya, when you come to visit, I found some 2006 illumination. 
Yes. We need to, we need to share about all that. It's incredible, fresh, bright, um, nutty, you know, but it's, it's just beautiful. Um, I don't think people, I don't think most people realize that you can age white wine and it's not just Chardonnay mm -hmm. um, and, and white Burgundy and red Burgundy and Bordeaux and anything else from around the world, but Sauvignon Blanc and Simeon and uh, Chenin Blanc, all of them, um, Beesling, and they just become much more textured and the wines are alive. Right. Wine is a living, breathing organism and it evolves just like people, places and things. That's how I like to think of it. Um, but to, to compare the two, 17, fresh, bright, lush, stone fruit, citrus, and there are these layers of minerality within the fruit, which is lush and ripe, but not too ripe, just enough. And it's as though you're just biting into a piece of, of succulent fruit. It really is. And it's the same with 18. It's just brighter and it's mouthwatering. You know, 17 is a meal in itself and you can have it just as you said, cocktail, have before, you know, you have dinner while you're cooking, while you're relaxing and reading a book or sitting under, you know, a tree in the shade. However, it's just, it's really, really wonderful and a great uh, partner to the red wine as well, but it goes with everything. It doesn't matter whether you have a salad in front of you, heirloom tomatoes, which are fantastic. Um, right now, don't be afraid of the acid that's in tomatoes. Tomatoes now where we are, it's, it's a piece of fruit. It's rich, succulent, um, just juicy um, fruit. Red vines, zebras, purple, all of it. Yeah. It's some burrata cheese some grilled peaches, any of it, some prosciutto, piece of fish, yeah. cured fish. Hey, even caviar. Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah. Ah. Well, I mean, that's, I'd say if you really want to treat yourself and this oh, is yeah. something that I did last weekend, I can't believe I did this to celebrate the beginning of harvest. I'm actually in the illumination harvest right now. I had oysters and I added caviar onto the oysters with illumination yes. because I, yeah, I'm a winemaker. I'm not a sommelier. I'm not a chef. And so when I'm doing food and wine pairing, I try to pick out a character in the wine and partner that match that um, with the character in the food. And so the minerality, the salinity of the oysters and the caviar. And mm -hmm. I think that that is great with illumination. Um, I also play with the tomatoes, of course. Mm -hmm. The peaches are perfect. There's a lot of peach. Um, you were talking about the 17 illumination. For me, yeah. that's a white peach. And then the 18 mm -hmm. is yellow peach. Yep. A little bit of, there's a herbal character as well. So mm -hmm. I like to put in like some tarragon mm -hmm. um, into the foods and and make myself pretty happy with this illumination. That's the savory part mm -hmm. that, that comes through um, which, with age and not savory as in green, but savory as in dried herb that comes through a melody of that. Um, but to me, winemakers are like chefs and, and like, you know, sommeliers as well because that's, that's what we do, but you are creating just as a chef does mm -hmm. as well. That's, that's Absolutely. Nice. That's yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's true. It is, thank you. you. Know? I say that. It's true. It's true. Yes. When you're putting together your final blend, you know, because it's several different 
barrels from different rows picked yeah. at different times, um, different vessels, as you said. Different, yeah, the cooking, that would be sort of the cooking thing. I think it is, mm -hmm. it is similar in that it matters your ingredients. Yeah. You have to start with great ingredients. And the you mentioned at the Quintessa estate, it was unplanted. I had never wow. been farmed before it became Quintessa. So this is a virgin piece of land. And wow. since the very beginning, this has been a property that has been cared for using organic techniques. So no synthetic chemicals have ever been used on this property and biodynamic as well since 1996. So we are firmly in the camp of that your practices matter mm -hmm. and that we need to have fresh and beautiful raw ingredients and that then we shepherd them through the fermentation process. We highlight different characters, you know, barrels can be considered spice components or salt, bringing out flavors that are inherent in the grapes and supporting them. Um, and then the wine itself should transport you directly back to where it's from. That's the philosophy. And where it's from is this estate of rolling hills, um, gentle hills. I actually have a picture. Um, do you mind? I'm going to share. Oh, I share awesome. I have a couple Please. pictures for everyone. So for those of you Whoa. who haven't had the opportunity to come to Quintessa, um, I saw that someone was joining us from West Orange, um, which is pretty cool. That is where my grandparents lived. Uh, West Look Orange, at that. Jersey. And this That's is where fantastic. I am now. So this is Quintessa. Yeah. This is a picture of the Quintessa estate uh, looking north. So we're in Rutherford, the historic heart of Napa Valley, right in the center. And we're along the Silverado Trail. So we are on the eastern side of Napa Valley, nestled uh, along the Vaca Mountain Range. So the mountain range that you see on the right side of this picture is the Vaca Mountain Range. On the far left, you can see another mountain range. That's the Mayacamas Mountain Range. That's, those are the two um, mountain ranges that form Napa Valley. And then right down the center uh, of Napa Valley, right oh, here, okay. this um, tree line, that's the Napa River. So Quintessa runs all the way from the Vaca Mountain Range to the Napa River. It's pretty incredible. Compromising two of the three main geologic features of Napa. And then as Sonia was saying, it's also got these rolling hills. This is unique. We're on the valley floor, but we have hillsides. Incredible. Um, it's just an, a beautiful place. Oh, Tony, I think you're muted. Okay. I did. I muted myself while you were speaking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're speaking. So someone was saying, so the illumination is a, a Bordeaux blend. Absolutely, yes. it is a Bordeaux white. It would not be um, considered um, Sancerre because it doesn't just have Sauvignon Blanc within. It is not um, produced in the style of Sancerre. It is produced in the style of white Bordeaux, which white Bordeaux are highly, highly ageable. They are super fantastic young and fresh and bright. And just as uh, this uh, Bordeaux, white Bordeaux style wine is um, as well. And I will say this, um, some people may not be familiar with um, the Muscat clone and the Muscat oh, clone yeah. kind of gives that, um, that savory kind of quality um, to a white wine, yes? Yes. So it's really, it's kind of a cool story. Um, we used to think, we call it Sauvignon Musquet or Musquet here. Mm -hmm. We actually used to think, and there was a debate about whether or not it was Sauvignon Blanc at all. Um, so up until the 1980s, people weren't sure if it was Sauvignon Blanc and would call it Sauvignon Musquet. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Carol Meredith out of UC Davis was able to do some genetic testing on it and discovered that it is in fact Sauvignon Blanc. So now it's considered a clone or a selection instead of a different variety. But it has a very different character, or not very different, a different character than Sauvignon Blanc. Mm -hmm. Sauvignon Blanc, which is mostly clone one here in California, is bright acidity, citrus, grapefruit pith, that kind of really linear acidity. Sauvignon Musquet has more perfume to it. It has this a um, little bit more tropical, a little bit more perfumed. Um, yeah, those kind of the herbal savory notes. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really interesting. So about half of the Sauvignon Blanc in the illumination is Sauvignon Musquet. It's one of my favorite selections. And also someone else have said umami, just <laughs> slightly umami as well, correct? Yes. And you know, Mark, I think that as the wine ages, you get more of that umami that comes through. And the umami usually comes through in the middle of the palate with the fruit, mineral, um, and, and herb that's there. Um, and to me, whenever umami pops up in a wine that lets me know that I will be able to pair this wine or many wines with different dishes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's for me, for my palate. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I usually uh, come up with and think. And I was going to say one other thing and, oh yes. So having said that it is uh, a blend, it does change every year. The proportions are not always the same, correct? That's correct. Um, yeah. It, it changes a bit year to year based off of the character of that year, right. you know, how the different blocks are, how much fruit's coming off them, what the, the results are. It's between 10 and um, between, I'd say 10 and 20% semillon. Um, and then the rest is Sauvignon Blanc with about half of that being Sauvignon Musquet. The semillon comes out, it, it, semillon is this, um, textural component, a little bit vanillic. When it's young, it doesn't have a whole lot of aromatics um, or necessarily flavor. But as the wine ages, it the illumination starts to build up this weight and this viscosity, and that's the semillon coming through. I think that that is. I mean, I don't know if that's part of why um, why Bordeaux wines age so well, why illumination age so well. You know, semillon is a very, very important part of this um, blend and this components. I've had people laugh at me because when I think of Simeon, I, I think of uh, white rocks and, and gray rocks, especially when they're, they're young. When they're young, they have that kind of quality and texture and, and flavor profile. And it's almost as though it's fruit um, stone fruit and citrus fruit that is really young yes and yes. that's that's what it is and when you add that component to me it just really lifts what's in the glass mm -hmm. um and that's why it's so fresh and bright and also mouth-watering that's the key mouth-watering oh. makes you want to take another sip and have another bite of whatever you were eating it does. And you know, a little trick um, that I've started to do is I also serve illumination at the end of a meal. Oh yeah. I pair it with palate. a dessert. Yep. yep. Palate cleanser or even, mm -hmm. I mean, forget about a meal. I do a lot of really long tastings, you know, a lot of wine, a lot of red wine, mm -hmm. put illumination at the end or even in the middle. And it just, it freshens everything up. It makes my mouth water again. Um, I would actually rather have that than a glass of water because we're always taught <laughs> to cleanse the palate with mm -hmm. water or bread. Um, if you are having uh, red wine, some uh, red meat um, uh, will help with that as well, carpaccio, things of that nature. But if you don't have any of that, some white wine, absolutely. That's yeah. Great. Illumination as a palate cleanser. <laughs> that is brilliant. Well, I heard you say you drink illumination instead of water. 
So yes. yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I'm taking, I'm taking that one with me. You take it. You take it. You can have it. You and I will both be using that one. <laughs> so Mark is saying 2017 was a hot year. Mm -hmm. um, and because he's throwing it in the chat right now. So 2017 was a hot year. Did you have to make special adjustments in the winemaking? That I did, and in the growing. So 2017 yeah. was a warm year with a extensive heat wave around Labor Day. We usually get a heat wave right around now, and it's usually just mm -hmm. you know two days, which for Bordeaux varieties is not is not really that damaging. It's totally fine. But in 2017, we had a heat wave of around 10 days over 100 degrees. So it was it was pretty extreme. And I noticed a big difference in the reaction to the, of the vines from the different parts of the property. Because here, let me go, actually, let me pop over here with this map. This is the vineyard. And it's, um, these are the, I have 26 different vineyard blocks on Quintessa and a multitude, very diverse soil types, a very diverse yeah. terroir. But in this picture, I've drawn it to show only three kind of main units of terroir. And at the top of this map is along the Silverado Trail, so along the Vaca mountain range. And what's here is these white volcanic ash soils. And they are very old. They had their origin in the Vaca mountain range. They actually were formed from a big landslide off of the Vaca mountain range about 5 million years ago. And they are, I think I said volcanic, very little clay. So those soils make a, when you're tasting the Quintessa, and actually in every vintage, this will show through, that finish, that length, and the texture of chalky, uh, like a fine chalky texture. That's from the white soils. Um, but because they have very little clay, they don't have as much, the vines don't have as much resilience at the end of the season to withstand the heat waves. Um, we have a Mediterranean climate here. We get all of our rainfall in the winter and then the summer becomes quite dry. Uh, this year is an extreme. We actually didn't really even get the winter rainfall, but mm -hmm. that's our general pattern. So the beginning of a season, um, the vines have plenty of water in all of the different type of soils that we have here. And then as we get towards that end of the season that correlates with that Labor Day heat wave, you have more or less challenging um, soils for these vines to be growing in. So what I noticed and what how I reacted in 2017 because of the heat is that these white soils were a little were more challenging to the vines. And I noticed a big difference between the young and the old vines. Um, Quintessa was planted in 1990. Um, it, like I said, it had been virgin land. There was no existing vineyards. And over time, we have replanted some of the blocks. Um, it was planted with all of the best thought at the time. It's an incredible opportunity to plant a virgin vineyard, but you don't get to learn from anyone else's mistakes. That's the downside, right? You don't have to live with anyone else's mistakes, but you also didn't get to learn from any of them. So we have done a little bit of replanting. And in 2017 on the white soils, I had um, young vines that were Cabernet Franc. And the old vines on the white soils, they have their resilience, they're really well-developed root systems, and they've had 30 years of experiencing this climate, the seasons, these soils. They knew what to expect and they got through that heat just fine, no problems. The younger vines had struggle. And because they were on the white soils, all the Cabernet Franc happened to be in that in 2017, all of the Cabernet Franc that was on the, producing on the property were younger vines and on white soils. Um, there is not Cabernet Franc in the 2017 blend. So mm -hmm. we do everything we can, but you know we have to adjust both in our farming, in our winemaking, and in our blending practices to every season. But the amazing thing about working with a property like Quintessa is that diversity is that fact that in every year, there are going to be parts of the property that are going to shine and the majority will. That 
red part in the middle around Dragon's Lake. That's what we call our mm -hmm. central hills. This is the mixed volcanics and some alluviums. So there's these cobbles and gravels and a well-draining soil that does have some clay because of that influence of a, some ancient river. It was actually before the Napa River. Um, and it has these hillsides, what we call locally, we call them tow hills. Mm -hmm. um, they were formed from the landslide that caused the Eastern Hills. When the Vaca Mountain Range fell down to cause the Eastern Hills of Quintessa, the earth behind it had to go somewhere. And it ripped, like, literally like water rippled up. And that caused those two Quintessa Hills. Um, and so that's why they're a mix of volcanics and some alluvium that they were once valley floor. And then they got pushed up to be these um, hillsides. These are kind of like, I think back, like the Goldilocks, right? If you think of Goldilocks, mm -hmm. this is the perfect, like it's not too, it's not too much clay. It's not too little clay. It's not, you know, these are what I'd call flexible terroir. This is the core of Quintessa. Um, and so that kind of excels in, in every particular vintage and every condition. And then as you get down on this map, you head towards the Napa River. Um, that is a clay loam. So this is a true alluvial soil. Um, it's young. If the Eastern Hills are about 5 million years old, the Central Hills are about 3 million years old or three to 5 million years old, the bench is like in the tens of thousands. It's not, geologically speaking, it's not that old. Um, and this is that clay loam. So this is the part of the property that is excellent in these heat waves. I mean, it's just, doesn't seem to be phased at all. It has that um, natural resilience of the clay soil that's very giving. And so the, the different characters of the different years, and you're right, 2017 was warm. 2018 that we're gonna be tasting um, together later is a mild season. Like there was no oh. heat waves. It was unusual for that fact. Um, and the expression of Quintessa in a hot year is darker fruit. So the fruit's actually more black than red. Mm -hmm. There's more mineral, like so tar, tobacco, chocolate character. And there is a, um, a structure to the tannin that is a bit more condensed or, or uh, contained. So think of a wine that pulls you into the glass for me 2017 like it just, it's seductive. It draws me in to the glass. It doesn't come out at me. It draws me in and it's silky and supple and um, just beautiful that way. So Rebecca, mm -hmm. I told people to start tasting their 2009 oh. if they have that in front yes. of them. So as we talk about the growing seasons, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly, 2009 was a shorter vintage, yes? Yes. So to and the, yeah. go ahead. It was, uh, 2009 was a really interesting year because it was a, it wasn't a particularly rainy winter mm -hmm. and the season started just kind of normal average, um, good amount of heat. And then it got a little bit cooler at parts of the mm -hmm. summer. So things sort of slowed down. Harvest was about average timing. And then it was, it was interesting because we experienced, and this is very rare for us, we actually experienced early fall rain in, 20, in 2009. Um, and it was, I mean, that's, that's no problem for Cabernet Sauvignon. It was beautiful. It actually caused the tannins to soften um, and 2009 for me is just this like perfumed, um, I think it's also lovely to be tasting because this for me and this vintage is exactly the age that I want to taste it, that I want to drink it. That's personal preference here. I'm going to stop my share so we can see better. Um, what do you know you what though? It, 2009 and 2010 did not mirror one another but 09 is classic California um, Cabernet to me. Mm -hmm. What we have seen growing up in the ages, um, in the history of 
California for Cabernet is what 09 and 10 are. And it's red fruit, black fruit, it's crushed tobacco, it's the pencil shavings that come through, um, it's clay, it's iron, it's mineral, and the tannins are supple tannins and they play with your palate intertwined with the fruit. And it's almost red vines, red vine licorice yeah. um, is what comes through mm -hmm. um, as well. And it's a lovely sipping wine, but with a meal, the wine just thrives and comes alive and, and shines. Yeah. And I think this is typical of 09 and you're right because of the early, the early rain um, in the fall. And it lends itself to being more, as we call old world in mm -hmm. style, much more for a, a Bordeaux blend. And I think what we should also say to people is it's, it's not a Cabernet Sauvignon. It is going to be a blend depending on what nature gives you. Yes. And yeah. That's right. So we have a huge amount of differences in the terroir. So 26 mm -hmm. different blocks, different of those soils, aspects, elevation. And we grow five red varieties on the property as well. Um, the majority of the blend is Cabernet Sauvignon. And then we have Cabernet right. Franc, Merlot, Petit Verdot, and Carmenere. Yeah. I don't think we mentioned a little bit about the family. Um, Augustine and Valeria Junaeus are originally uh, from Chile. And yeah. Augustine got his start and has been in the wine business for over six decades at this point. Yep. Yep. Uh, I just had lunch with him last week and he's, it's now more than six decades. Mm -hmm. He began in the 1960s um, working with Conciatoro and yeah. rescue, basically rescuing Conciatoro from being a failing bulk wine producer to being the most exported Chilean wine um, in the world. Mm -hmm. And then he moved to, or the family moved to the United States in the 1970s. And Augustine has been a part of some of the game-changing mm -hmm. California wineries, um, Franciscan, Estancia, Mount Veeder, um, Paul Masson, for anyone who remembers those guys. Um, I mean, just some really incredible story. And he is an icon in this industry. And his wife, Valeria, is absolutely amazing as well. She's a viticulturalist. Mm -hmm. So she has studied um, wine growing and she managed the family vineyards. That's how they discovered and founded Quintessa. Wow. Valeria and Augustine were looking for a project that could be the culmination of a lifetime working in wine and a place where they could utilize everything that they have learned and their belief about what makes a great wine estate. And Valeria discovered Quintessa as this, in 1989, as this virgin piece of land, walked onto it and immediately knew that this was the place yeah. and convinced her husband and they were able to acquire the property and, and begin Quintessa, which was from the very beginning founded to be a estate wine. So kind of classic model and make classic wines yeah. um, where you grow all your own grapes. We have our own team. We have our winery. I'm actually stand, sitting on top of the winery right now. We bottle the wine here and the wine is a red blend. Um, so in the younger vintages, so starting with like 2017, maybe 2016, I can't remember, we did start sharing the percentages of the blend because mm -hmm. people seem to want to know. But, you know, if you ask me, I don't think it matters so much because yeah. Quintessa is the wine as a representation of the estate. And yeah. in every year, it's going to change. Um, and that that's pretty cool. Um, and the Carmenere is a little special thing that is a nod to the Chilean heritage. Um, but it's not just about being cute. Carmen, you're actually really, mm -hmm. really works well out here. It needs yeah. a long season. We've planted it on, we have two blocks of Carmen and they're on west facing hillsides, so really rocky, warmer sites. 
got a long season. You get that um, kind of plush tannin. And it's a little bit like Merlot in terms of its tannin profile and a very savory herbal, I mean, just it's beautifully exotic um, notes in the wine. And so it's a big fun part. I love Carmenere and I like it slightly chilled. I like it fresh and young and I like it with age on it. Just super um, expressive. And um, I've always been a huge proponent of aged wines to follow the life um, of a wine. And if we dive into 2017, as you said, you know where you are, you know what you're tasting, you know what estate you're on. There's always this ribbon or this thread that follows through every vintage of the wine that lets you know exactly what you have in your glass. Um, and I say that because if you've ever had a bottle of Quintessa and you have a second bottle of Quintessa and then a third from different vintages, you know what's in your glass, <laughs> even before someone tells you what's in your glass. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope so. That, that's what I hope. Um, it, it does. Grew. Believe me, it does. It yeah. does. It really it's does. A, it's such a beautiful place and such a strong terroir that it really mm. can't help um, but doing that. And I think that the the organic and the biodynamic practices, the very clear vision of Augustine and Valeria Huneus, um, and the consistency. And now at you know 30 years of age for the estate, yeah. we're finally coming into this. It's a it's a really exciting time for us. Um, I'm really excited about the 2018 vintage and, and to be sharing it and talking about it because it it represents or it holds within it when you're working with an estate. Every year is a built upon the last. And so mm -hmm. after 30 years of working with this property about understanding the character of the estate, the vines themselves understanding their place, their, you know, vines can't, plants cannot move. We, when things go bad, you know, people, people can get up and leave. Vines can't, they have this capacity to adapt. They have this capacity to express their place. And ha after having 30 years of being there, I feel like they are expressing themselves so clearly and so purely. Um, and that's, that's what gets me so excited about these wines. And drinking the older wines, the wines that I think are now ready to be drunk, like have had that time. I don't know, maybe it's like kids, like when, when you have them, when they're young, they're yours. Um, but when they are older, they are, they're themselves. They have their, they have become who they want to be. Their own life experience is like etched on their face and they are, they've left you. Um, and so it's, it's really wonderful to be tasting them and to taste the 2009 and compare it to the 2017 and see what, the difference vintages, yes, but also different time um, has, has created in, in the differences in those wines. So 2017 is the flavor profile is, you can tell that it was a moderate year, but it was, there were also some, some heat spikes as well, because we've got a blend of red fruit, um, black and blue fruits um, that are coming through there's still that line of earth and herbal um, and minerality and savory and pencil shavings that was in nine is also in 2017, mm -hmm. but we've got these black and red and blue fruits with the skin and the juice of those fruits as well. Um, and there's cocoa shavings that are in this one. There's definite uh, chocolate mocha. Um, and instead of red vines, this is definitely black vine, black licorice, black, black licorice that comes through, but it's the sweet, not the green or the super mm -hmm. herby that sometimes people think of um, that is there as well, intertwined with, with the fruit. And, because of it 
being different um, soil types and the alluvial fan, which is pretty much kind of throughout um, the property and that comes through when you are, are blending as well. So as you, as a winemaker, as you're going through and you're going to start, well, you're in the middle of harvest now, um, even before you've started, you've gone through the different vineyard sites, you've tasted the fruit and you know what's ready, what's not ready, where those um, phenolics are going to fall um, as well. I don't think people realize that winemakers do that and they can figure that out pretty much as they've gone through the life of the vineyard within that growing season. Right. So, I mean, it, it all starts with Actually, it starts with the season before. Um, yeah. The conditions of bloom in the season before is what actually sets the fruit for the next year. Like there really is all of those connections. And then as I am walking through the vineyard now, that's what I'm doing right now is I'm walking through the vineyard and I'm tasting grapes and I'm, I'm seeing whether or not they're 17. ready. Is that 17? Uh-huh. And I'm tasting them and I'm, I'm looking at the canopies and I'm getting a sense of what the vintage is going to be because what I can taste and what I can feel are those phenolics. You know, I can see how many berries do we have per, I mean, sorry, how many seeds do we have per berry? Well, I mean, you know, the tannin comes from the seeds. So that gives me a little sense of how tannic or how, what's the potential size of the tannin and, and of this year. Um, does the wine seem to attack the soft tissue of my mouth? Um, and I'm making all of those decisions and really kind of getting my understanding of the vintage as grapes and tasting through. And I talk and I think a lot more about texture than I do about aromas, um, mm -hmm. particularly as I'm, I'm tasting a lot of really young wines. Yes. A great texture great tannin profile is going to age, develop, but stay great. Mm -hmm. So the way the wine tastes young, um, it the aromas, a lot of the flavors are going to be a little bit overwhelmed by that fruit character that you were pointing out, like the, not overwhelmed, but that is the first thing that you're going to notice. It's the first thing that comes out. It's the primary fruit. But as that ages and that kind of those those compounds, they dissipate and they react and become something new. Um, what was underneath that shows through the savory, the herbal, the umami, and the tannins kind of do the same thing where you have that initial young wine gives you a lot of body. There's a lot of texture, a lot of body, a lot of upfront character, but the inherent quality of that texture is going to stay as the wine ages and develops. And it will like smooth out, but it that quality of that texture stays through. So that's something that I, I'm thinking about all the time right now, because what I'm doing every morning is walking through the vineyard and tasting all these grapes and, you know, rubbing them around in my mouth and be like, hmm, I wonder, I don't know, what's 2021 going to be like? It's the foundation, the building block of what is going to be the wine. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. And I, and I think that's how you judge a young wine and you judge its ageability. Does it have all of the components that it takes to be ageable? Does it have acidity and balance and texture and body? And, you know, it's, it can be beautiful to drink young, but you, you know, if you point, if you mm -hmm. think about what it takes to be an ageable wine, you can see all of those components together. Um, that they have the quality of texture. It has the harmony, like that. that is the characters that are going to stay. So what I heard you say when you were talking about a Goldilocks vintage, as we go into 18, mm -hmm. everything that you said to me about 18 being mild and just more or less a perfect vintage. Kind of. 18. I mean 18th of Goldilocks wine. It is really we like incredible. Goldilocks. Goldilocks we do, I mean, means everything. We love Goldilocks 
in whatever <laughs> age or stage it is in. We like Goldilocks young. Yeah. We like Goldilocks five years in. We like Goldilocks 10 years in. We like Goldilocks 15, 20 years in. 20 years in. Plus, you know, we just, we do. And, you know, I think that that's, that's so true. And that's what's so exciting about 18 is that it, wow. it shows all of those characters. Um, but the Quintessa estate has that Goldilocks component itself. I mean, you have that because you have the structure of volcanic soils, mm -hmm. you have a bit of a almost mountain tannin, you have a tight core, and then you have the alluvial, you have along the river, you have this fleshiness and the river, well, like if I was digging pits or showing you guys some soils and interesting, it's not as interesting a soil pit. Like there really isn't rocks, the roots go straight down, yeah. um, but it is so important. I think that that is what allows Quintessa to be beautiful young. And then the volcanic components that is what holds everything together. It's like your structure, your skeleton um, and your connective tissue and holds it all together. Whereas the bench is that like fleshiness that makes you squeezable um, and soft and just beautiful to, Quintessa can be beautiful to drink young. I have to tell you, 18 is Goldilocks. You're absolutely right. I haven't even tasted it yet. All I keep doing is, is smelling and it's yeah. just, it's, it jumps out of the glass. There are all these floral notes of violets and, and roses and blackberries and blueberries and black cherry and, and pomegranate. It's just, it's a melange of fruit and the fruit's not super ripe, but mm -hmm. just ripe enough to get all the aromatics that are there and make you super happy and want to take a sip. Yeah. Wow. I know we're so, I'm so proud of this. Um, wow. It's just this, I don't, I don't really say like, I don't want to say easy vintage, um, mm. but it was just really even, really even long vintage, a lot of precise decisions and the wine came together, that blend came together. Um, it's been incredibly well received. Um, and so we are just the actual official. So this is a very young wine. The official release date of 2018 was yesterday. Well, I'm super lucky. That's, so that's a baby. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you think? I mean, I think that this is a 20 plus year potential it's aging. Delicious. Yeah, it's, it's delicious. It is. And what you have now in the glass is going to develop um, even more and you will still have that, that fruit structure, which will become interwound and interlaced with all of the earth mineral. There's a bit more of the clay mm -hmm. and the white, white rock and white stone um, and a bit of the gravel uh, that comes in for me texturally on, on the palate. Um, for me, when I taste, I can, I process and, and see, I can see rocks. I can see all of that as I'm tasting. Um, and it's just, it's, it's pretty, pretty incredible. This wine is so good. It just, it's a beautiful property and just the love and care, um, that you all take, um, in being the stewards and the guardians of the land. It's it's really phenomenal because everything, there's a purity to what you're doing and the fruit that comes from, from, the, from the land and from the project is just, it's very focused and just very clean and precise and unadulterated in, in all of the projects and products that come out of it. It really makes a difference with what you've done. Oh, thank you. It does. I, mean, I think it, I think it does too. And I think that it's, yeah. I mean, per personally, it's an honor to be a part of this and to, yeah. you know, I think I'm making wine and being a part of Quintessa and having something that's going to live beyond me. I'm just mm -hmm. a little, and all of us, we're just little parts of this story. Um, God, when we think of the, what, how the hillsides were formed, I mean, that yeah. we're part yeah. of a story that started 5 million years ago. Yeah. Um, 
And how do we express this? How do we capture this into the glass and make a wine that is going to bring joy to people? I think, I mean, I hope that people enjoy it and, and, um, you know, follow, follow the development of Quintessa in their own home and see how they like it. So we have a question about, mm -hmm. do you, uh, strictly, uh, follow the phases of the moon and your biodynamic mm. uh farming and you know yeah. it's it's, it's the farmer's question. almanac right yeah it's the old farmer's almanac right you know the face so if you work with plants and and also if you work in winery but um you do know that the phases of the moon do affect the flow it affects how things are settling are you pulling up are you pulling down these kind of gravitational flows but it's also i think in terms of biodynamics it's actually something that is not that's not the number one practice of biodynamics mm -hmm. the number right. one thing is to promote soil health and soil, mm -hmm. like the diversity of your soil, the health of your soil. So the main practices in biodynamics that we're, we're working with are the preps. So what we call the biodynamic preps. If you guys have ever seen the picture of the cow horn, cow horn manure, yeah. cow horn silica, well, there's a series of preps and they are all focused on soil health. Um, actually all except one. So the, and that is the fundamental practice of biodynamics is in promoting health and trying to close the system as we talk about it. So our winery waste is used in our compost pile to try and create the, not have outside inputs mm -hmm. and the farming according and, and practicing according to the lunar calendar. Well, I mean, we do choose auspicious days for doing things, mm -hmm. but that's a bit like the cherry on the top of the Sunday. Um, the meat of, of the practice is in your compost pile, really, is working yeah. with your compost and your soil health, um, and which is a lot of fun. We've got, um, yeah. we've got cows on the property, um, sheep mm -hmm. on the property. I was actually just um, visiting the cows on my vineyard walk this morning. Uh, there's a bull on the property right now who's a lot of fun. Um, and they are adding, they're there for their contribution to the compost pile, to their contributions um, to the biodynamic preps, and just for their energy to like have that kind of fun moo energy and bringing in their thoughtfulness and their um, connection with the seasons and the ground. Um, so I guess that's a long answer. So sometimes yes, the along with the phases of the moon and sometimes no. But the most important thing to do is good farming. Yeah. They're a part of the ecosystem. Yes. I think of it as having all of those elements there to bring in and keep in the good elements and leave out those elements that you don't want there. Yes. That's yes. And to like keep keep the good energy. Yeah. Not, and not let your, I mean, every like not let your energy dissipate. Don't right. just throw things here and there, um, but to be very thoughtful in, in everything that you do. Um, yeah. And so that's why biodynamics is, is more of a philosophy even than um, anything else. Yeah, it is. This is delicious. Thank you. Yeah, 2018 is Goldilocks. You heard it here <laughs> today on Rager Cellar, Benchmark Wines. I know that there was another question that uh, came up, there was a question about um, adding Carmenere. Um, does it still make it a true Bordeaux blend? Oh. And I think people sometimes forget when we talk about um, the originality of blends and blends coming from Bordeaux, there was Carmenere that was grown, there was Syrah. Um, that was grown durif, um, in those parts of the world. And they still are. Um, and as, as our climate changes and weather changes, we are going to see those probably a little bit more prominent mm -hmm. uh, than not because of, of how they grow That's and how sustainable um, that they are. Yeah, so, Carmen Year was, um is actually considered one of the Bordeaux varieties. It's the yep. sixth, the lost variety, the sixth Bordeaux variety. 
-hmm. And it was planted extensively in Bordeaux pre phylloxera. And then when they replanted from phylloxera, they did not replant a lot of Carmenere um, yeah. because Carmenere can struggle in a colder region. And, and Bordeaux at that time was a colder region. Right. So it was uh, still, it was brought over to Chile. And I think for a long time, the Chileans thought it was Merlot. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's the story. <laughs> well, you know, I saw Michelle Roland told me that he in the 80s was walking a vineyard in Chile with an owner who will remain nameless, who was pointing out their Merlot. And he was wondering at what point he could tell her that that was not Merlot. <laughs> but yeah, so Carmenere was, um, was uh, recovered um, from Chile with all of these old vine Carmenere vineyards in Chile that were brought over, I think originally mistakenly thinking it was maybe Merlot, maybe they thought it was Carmenere, yeah. who knows, but that's, that's been great for us. And I think Carmenere is gonna do really well in a warming climate. And I think you'll yes. be seeing a lot more of it. Yeah. Carmenere is good stuff. Yeah. Very when it's good, good it's great. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And so I will add to everyone, which Rebecca's being super uh, modest. It's a 99.1 wine 2018 is. That's, that's pretty incredible um, out the gate. And it's not just because of the score that it's Goldilocks. It's because of what's inside the bottle and what's inside of the glass. So kudos to you Thank and you. to everyone, the whole team yeah. um, there at Quintessa. It's just, it's delicious. I can't wait to have it on the wine list and, and have it and serve it uh, to everyone. Well, yeah, soon. pretty incredible stuff. Does anyone have any questions? Because I know I kind of, as questions popped up, I answered questions because they were relevant to what we were talking about um, at that moment. And I think that's probably almost it. There was a person that asked about the fires and how does that mm -hmm. um, affect you? And I think it depends upon the year and what's happening That's in right. the area and surrounding areas. And each, it's not the same every year. It's not. No, um, you know, and fire has been part of our ecosystem forever here. Um, it's mm -hmm. a natural part of the system. And we though are, experiencing more fire seasons and early and earlier fire seasons. So, you know, that it's probably not the most satisfactory answer, but I'm not, I'm not sure yet um, what the effect of the fires are. It's so new to experience fires during the growing season. And what I can tell you though, is the wines that I'm tasting in my cellar, the wines from 2020, where we did have a fire um, during, like started in August all throughout California, there are some beautiful wines in the cellar. And so I don't think it's, it's not gonna be a simple answer. It's not, you know, if there was a fire, then you as a consumer should stay away from the wines. I think that is, I mean, support us, come visit us. You know, if, when you see fires and you see the fires in Tahoe, like please support everyone, but it's not, uh, it's not going to be something that you're gonna see in the bottle. I can tell you that. No. No. Oh, and I, someone's yeah. asking about my dog. I know about your dog. <laughs> yeah. They're not here with me right now. They're sleeping at home. Um, that's cute. <laughs> How could I not mention my dogs? That's right. That's um, right. Next time I'll bring out, I actually got a very cute. So I have two large dogs or I'd say medium, but I guess medium large dogs um, that are really fun to bring into the vineyard. And I actually got one of them a little barber vest. So she's like a, a vineyard dog with like a little winemaker's vest on. It's really cute. Oh, I love it. I love it. Those are for the cold mornings, right? He gets cold. Yeah. 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 Those are and for the cold and mornings. And it's cute. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they are little... <laughs> it's relative how large they are. 
<laughs> well, that's good to know. They're rabbits. So there's all sorts of wildlife. Oh, rabbits. On the coyotes. property. Yeah. I've actually seen river otters, of course, bobcats. Thank yeah. God I've never seen mountain lions. We do not have them here. Um, yeah. Or deer. But we have when, you know, so we were talking about the vineyard and we talk about the organic practices and, and farming initially from organics, um, using organic um, practices from the very beginning. But you know what else is even more incredible? Valeria refused to cut any trees down to develop the vineyard. And so we have mm -hmm. all of the existing native oak woodlands. And so the amount of native animals and plants mm -hmm. that we have on the property are really important. That's important for the ecosystem and the terroir. Yep. yep. Uh, yeah. So it's mm -hmm. pretty cool to see. Yeah. All right. What's my, uh, I, I can see the questions now. What's my favorite yeah. vintage of Quintessa? Oh, you know, that's not a fair, that's a hard question. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's like having children, right? It's like having who's children. Or also, kid? yeah, who's your favorite? Well, who's your favorite brother or sister? Yeah. And then yeah. you have to set the, what like set and setting, like, am I at dinner? Do we have ribeye? Do we have, you know, like a turkey? So I'll tell you turkey. So the, for the last couple of Thanksgivings, I've had a Quintessa at about 10 years age. I had 2011 last year after tasting this uh -huh. 2009. I think I'm going to have 2009 with my Thanksgiving mm -hmm. meal. Yeah. Um, but if I have, if you were going to give me like a ribeye or something pretty strong, I would go with 17. Yeah. Yeah. 17 or yeah. 18. Yeah. So it's a hard, it's a hard question. And if anyone has 2010 in their cellar, mm -hmm. open it and drink it. It's beautiful. There's man. some parts, there's, there's some parts of 18 that remind me of 2010. The fruit's just slightly not quite as dark as 10 was upon um, release, but I feel the same kind of way that I felt about 10 upon release that I do with 18. Yeah. 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 yeah I think it's that, that the brightness and the freshness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Those are both great vintages. So I don't I have to have anything to eat. I could just have a glass of... <laughs> Quintessa red and be very happy. Yes. <laughs> or um, lightly salted potato chips are another Ooh. one of my favorite pairings. So, the Taras. Yeah. With oh, um, yeah. black truffle. The Taras truffle. Yep. So that's and the, the ham and the jumbo oh. ham, which are new. That's always, that's really good too. Now, see, both of those actually go with. Um, the illumination. Those work perfectly with the illumination as well. Everything goes with illumination. Everything does go with illumination. <laughs> and I'm right back there. I know. I, I, know I need to have some more illumination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do we have one more? What illumination, you know, what Quintessa wine goes best with? Dark chocolate. Ooh. What, what do, do you think? think? Oh, I was <laughs> well, you know what? To have what I have in front of me today, mm -hmm. my first choice would be 2017. Yeah. Because I've got fruit, I've got structure, I've got minerality. I actually have hints of chocolate. The shavings of chocolate are already there to me mm -hmm. on my palate. And when we talked about matching flavor profiles, I would have to say 2017. If yeah. I were thinking about chocolate, that's where I would go right now in front of me more so than, than 2009. 2009, I would actually um, have with a piece of hard cheese, some mm -hmm. mimolette, oh, uh, or funny. some fiscalini bandage wrapped would be yes. fantastic. Um, with uh, 09 and I could have with 18 some uh, ipois and some apples and be very happy. Oh, okay. Oh, that's good. 
Those are some good pairings. I need to write this down. Mm, I think this is being yeah. recorded. But you can refer back to them. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely, I agree with the dark chocolate and the um, mm -hmm. 17. Um, yeah. But, and to be honest, I do find dark chocolate or chocolate in general hard to pair with wine. Yep, um, it is. Yeah. Which is why I think you were correct when you were talking about cooking. Mm -hmm. and thinking about certain elements within the dish and then pairing them with something yes. that's within the wine. Um, and I think a lot of chefs think that way as well when they're cooking. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you got to no. taste through. Really no. But I think we've kept people. We're almost 10 minutes or more after, but does anyone have any other questions before we sign off this afternoon? Anybody? I hope you had some Quintessa in front of you today. And if you did not, please do check uh, the benchmark site um, for, um, <laughs> thank you, Pete, those beautiful dogs. <laughs> please Don't check worry. The, uh, the benchmark <laughs> wine site. And uh, please go and see your friends at Quintessa for a yeah. visit. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Please come visit or, or, you know, visit virtually by opening up the bottle of wine. Um, there you go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you guys.